Hello, my name is Gavin Mackay, and today we're going to look at the history of German cinema and a couple of film theories. And then we're going to focus on one of my favourite German directors. Before we start, I'll tell you why I decided to focus on Germany. When I was in school, I studied German at GCSE level. This was my first introduction into the German culture and way of life. I spent a couple of years abroad, and during that time I became very good friends with a lot of German people. And through them, I learned a lot about German culture and their way of life. And my German improved. When I was given this task, I decided I wanted to focus on the new area, and German cinema felt like something I would enjoy researching. German cinema is often treated more like an art and not like business. They generally are intellectually challenging, and they aren't a typical A-list or Hollywood action blockbuster movie. Because of this, their mass appeal has been reduced. We're going to look quickly into a couple of film theories. The first one we're going to look at is Expressionism. Expressionism is an art form that typically will have distorted sets and will experiment with perspective in order to evoke moods and ideas in the viewer. Expressionism originally started in pre-war Germany, but evolved more after World War I. Germany banned foreign films in 1916, and because of this there was a greater demand for domestic films to be made. This led to a massive increase in the production of mass films in Germany, from 14 in 1914 to 130 in 1918. Most popular films would include Metropolis <laughs> The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari <laughs> Destiny and the Last Laugh Around 1922, foreign audiences had started to grow an appreciation for German Expressionism, and it had an influence on a lot of international directors. The most popular would probably be Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock worked in Germany during the 1920s, and later said, I acquired a strong German influence by working at the UFA studios in Berlin. We can see its influence throughout his career. In The Lodger, we can see familiar set designs and lighting techniques. One of the most influential Expressionism films is Fritz Lang's silent film Metropolis. Metropolis follows Freider, the wealthy son of a city ruler, and Maria, a poor worker as they try to overcome the separation of classes in their city. It had a big influence on Tim Burton with his 1992 adaptation of Batman, often being described as a modern attempt to capture the essence of German Expressionism. The cityscapes of Gotham seem like a throwback to the looming towers of Metropolis. Metropolis has influenced a lot of modern films, as I said earlier, Tim Burton's Batman and also Ridley Scott's 1982 film Blade Runner. The next film theory we're going to look at is Psychoanalysis. What is Psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis was developed by Austrian doctor and lecturer Sigmund Freud. Freud developed a theory saying that all humans have unconscious impulses which conflict with defences for supremacy. He further developed his theory by saying that all the components of human personality are broken down and characterised in the three unconscious forces in the mind, known as the ID, the ego and the superego. An easy way to explain this is to imagine yourself being the ego. On one of your shoulders is a little devil called the ID and on the other shoulder is an angel called your superego. Freud says that everyone has these forces in their unconscious mind, and the balance of these three affect their consciousness and actions. Psychoanalysis has been a feature in films pretty much since films began. A good example of psychoanalysis in film would be Alfred Hitchcock's film Psycho. Psycho tells the story of motel owner Norman Bates. Throughout the film we see that he has a weird obsession with his mother, in this film, we see what happens when someone experiences an overpowering ID. It causes him to have animalistic instincts, and he turns out to be a serial killer. He was always bad, and in the end, he intended to tell them I killed those girls and that man. Another form of psychoanalysis that I find particularly interesting is escapism. Escapism is a form of distraction or escape from harsh realities and the boring, scary aspects of life. Escapism is mostly found in books, movies, video games and songs. Sigmund Freud considered escapism as a necessary element in the life of humans. They cannot subsist on the scanty satisfaction they can extort from reality. 
we simply cannot do without auxiliary constructions. During the Great Depression, escapism became a popular way for dealing with the hardships caused by the stock market crash. Media was aimed at helping people mentally escape from their situation, which was extreme poverty as their currency became worthless. The Wizard of Oz came out near the end of the Great Depression and is a good parallel of the Great Depression. The characters in the movie represent people and feelings like experienced during the Depression. One of the key concepts during the film is the concept of returning home. Dorothy's entire time in Oz is spent trying to get back home to Kansas, which fitted perfectly to the time of the Great Depression as many people were forced away from their homes and cities. And it was also released when America was on the verge of going to war, meaning the threat of having to send trips away from home was very real. Dorothy represents the American values of the people. Dorothy proves to be loyal, resourceful and determined. Toto is meant to represent average Americans, and the Tin Man represents the industrial workers who had lost their jobs during the Great Depression. They experienced being dehumanised and felt helpless. In the book, the Tin Man used to be a human, but a witch cursed him so that every time he swung his axe he lost the body part. The Tin Smith replaced his missing limbs with tin parts until eventually his whole body was tin. The Cowardly Lion is said to represent a politician called William Jennings Bryan, who was viewed as having a loud war but no power to bite. The film ends with Toto exposing the wizard as a fraud, who then grants them what they need. The Tin Man gets a heart, the Lion gets courage, the Scarecrow gets a brain, and Dorothy returns home to realise there is no place like home. Now we're going to quickly look at the development and the history of German cinema. The earliest cinemas in Germany primarily showed British and French films. The first German film to appear was Max Max's 1913 film, The Other One, which was based on a well-known play. Prior to World War I, there wasn't a lot of domestic films produced. Germany had banned international films, which had helped increase the amount of domestic films. After the First World War, a more liberal culture triggered a massive output across all of the arts. Filmmakers embraced new freedoms by combining expressionism and avant-garde theatre to create the first horror films. Dr. Vina's 1920 film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, became the benchmark of German expressionism and was regarded as a benchmark of international cinema. German cinema flourished until the rise of Nazism in the 1930s. During this period, a lot of German filmmakers fled for Hollywood. Once Hitler rose to power in 1933, the remaining filmmakers fled to Hollywood, including Ernst Lubstich, Michael Kutrich, and Douglas Sirk. They had all become world famous filmmakers in Hollywood. Adolf Hitler placed Joseph Goebbels as head of propaganda. They viewed cinema as a very powerful way to reach the masses and unite them towards the same goal. One of the main goals of Goebbels was to promote escapism, which was designed to distract the masses and keep everyone in good spirits. Goebbels had blamed the loss of World War I on the failure to sustain the morale of the people. They produced anti-Semitic films to mould their public opinion. One of the most notorious films is De Eidwege Jew, or The Eternal Jew. Created in 1940, it was presented as a documentary and it was an anti-Semitic version of the British film of the same name that portrayed Jews in a favourable light. It was divided into four areas, recordings in Polish ghettos, evaluation of numerous political, cultural and social values in the Jewish origin, religious structure and Adolf Hitler's Reichstag speech. It promoted the view that Jews were inferior and uncivilised and the Nazi idea of there being a master race. They blamed the Jews for inflation and the unemployment in Germany. When it was released, the film wasn't very popular and was regarded as a flop, with the German people saying, We've seen enough Jewish filth. We don't need to see any more. After the war, the director Franz Hitler was tried for directing the Edvige Judah, who was found not guilty, as he said that Joseph Goebbels was the true director with Hitler's close supervision. We're going to focus on Otar theory now. Otar theory, which is derived largely from Alexander Ostrich's concept, holds that the director who oversees all audio and visual elements of the motion picture is more to be considered the author of the movie than is the writer of the screenplay. The word auteur comes from French, which means author. The films created by an auteur act as a reflection of their own personality, allowing them to replicate personal life experiences within scenes and characters in their works. John Coggy highlights in this book by stating, a film is more than likely to be the expression of his individual personality, and that this personality can be traced in the thematic and or stylistic consistency overall, or almost all, of the director's films. 
Popular with hers would be Stanley Kubrick and Alfred Hitchcock, as you can see their style in all of their movies. There's a number of popular and noteworthy German directors, from Fritz Lang, director of Metropolis and M, to Tom Twiger, who directed From Lola Run and Cloud Atlas. My personal favourite is a director called Michael Haneke. Now, technically he's Austrian and half German, but I put him in as a German director. He is most famous for directing Hidden or Funny Games. He bases some scenes in his films on some of his personal experiences. For example, in Caché, there is a scene where a boy is slaughtering chickens, and he says, The slaughtered film in Caché is actually based on a traumatic experience from my childhood. Caché, this is dramatisch ist Erlebnis für mich als, als Kind. Also da wurde eben herumgeschlagen und der Kopf abgehackt und das ist halt dann ohne Kopf da herumgesprungen und das Blut kam aus dieser Öffnung raus und ich war da was nicht vier oder fünf und ich war fassungslos und so. Wenn man als Kind in der Stadt aufwächst, sieht man all diese Dinge nicht. Ne? Und, und äh, der ist natürlich, also man ist in dem Alter, denke ich, von so kreatürlichen Vorgängen natürlich automatisch vorstellen. Nicht nur in dem Alter, auch als Erwachsener. Also ich meine, das sind einfach Dinge. According to Haniki, the ideal film scene is one the spectator cannot stand. In his films, violence typically occurs off screen and instead he focuses on the face of a character observing the violence. This technique makes the violence more disturbing and a lot more personal. During an interview, Haneki says, I think it's more important to work with the viewer's fantasy. The viewer's fantasy is always more powerful than any image. The creaking floorboard is worse than the monster in the door. Michael Haneki has his own style which includes the use of long takes, which make the scene more tense and gives a sense of real time as seen in this clip. He doesn't normally make use of non diegetic music, except for funny games where the opening scene features loud rock music. His films feature toned down colours and unremarkable settings. I believe Michael Haneke should be regarded as an auteur because his own style applies to all of his movies. If you watch a few of his movies, you'll notice how they all feel very similar and he uses a lot of the same techniques I've mentioned before, which in my opinion are key characteristics for being an auteur. I have really enjoyed talking about the history of German cinema and the types of film theories and then going further down the rabbit hole to make a psychoanalysis. I'd like to finish with a quote from John Lewis, Not the Store, about why film analysis is important. Film analysis enables us to recognise how the filmmakers have their magic on us. I'm Gavin McKay and thank you very much for watching. Good night. We're going to look into a psychoanalyst. No. <laughs> That's not how you say it. The next film theory we're going to look into is psychoanalyst. The next film theory we're going to look into is psychoanalyst. Ah, psychoanalysis. The next film theory we're going to look into is psychoanalyst. Have I spelled it wrong? No, no. Analysis. <laughs> I got this.